Thank you for the recognition and thanks to our panel for joining us today. Professor Tolson, until 2013, until the Shelby County Beholder decision, Georgia and jurisdictions within Georgia had to pre-approve changes to voting laws with the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice in accordance with Section 5 of the VRA. After the Shelby County decision gutted Section 5, preclearance was no longer a barrier and the state and jurisdictions within it were free to enact changes without federal oversight. And that's exactly what we've seen. And I want to highlight in particular the closure of polling places in Georgia. At least 214 polling places in Georgia have been closed since the Shelby County Beholder decision was made. And we've seen that the impact of these closures uh, has been most profoundly felt by minority voters and in minority communities. So Professor Tolson, my question for you, what threat do polling place closures and relocations pose to voting access and why therefore is known practices coverage, which we're discussing today in this hearing, a necessary tool to mitigate that threat and protect ballot access? Thank you, Senator. It's, it's, incredi it's incredibly important, in part because in Georgia in particular, you saw the strategic closure of polling places in uh, minority areas. And this led to 9, 10, 11 hour waits in some uh, parts of uh, uh, Fulton County in particular. But uh, statewide, you definitely had problems with uh, voters having to wait in line for a long time. I think there's this perception that the uh, the pandemic caused a lot of this, right? But you had increased rates of absentee voting. You still have voters waiting in line to vote in person for a really long time. And this is in part a response to, to Shelby County. Since 20 since 2013, um, jurisdictions formerly covered by Section 5 have closed on average 20% more polling places than uh, jurisdictions in the rest of the country. So the problem that we saw in Georgia is something that is, is very widespread and pra practice-based preclearance will help mitigate some of that. Thank you, Professor Tolson. And some opponents of preclearance requirements have said it's too hard for jurisdictions to prove to the Justice Department that changes would not harm ballot access for minority voters. Is that true? Is it reasonable to expect that a jurisdiction understands the impact of changes to voting access on minority voters before making that change? And is it reasonable to presume good intent on the part of those same actors? Yes, Senator, I would think that jurisdictions would perform this, this sort of cost benefit analysis prior to determining whether or not to close a polling place. Um, if they have done so, then it shouldn't be administratively difficult for them to prove that they are uh, that they need to close the polling place. I would also point out that under the prior coverage formula, um, hundreds of jurisdictions comply with the Voting Rights Act administratively um, with no problem. We tend to focus on the bad actors and the fact that they litigate changes for years and years and years. Uh, but in reality, this is not a huge administrative lift for most jurisdictions who are acting in good faith. Thank you, Professor Tolson. Redistricting is one of the practices that Congress is considering including in a covered practices provision of the John Lewis legislation. What is the best evidence that redistricting poses a particular threat to racial and language minority voters? Is that also for me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, so redistricting, especially now as we are at, at the beginning of our, uh, uh, the redistricting that occurs at the beginning of the decade, uh, minority communities are in, in this moment very, very in very weak positions because uh, many of the, many states have passed restrictive voting laws. And in those states, you'll see efforts to try to gerrymander uh, racial minorities into districts, which is something that was extensively litigated over the last decade. So cases came out of uh, North Carolina, out of Alabama, out of Texas, where uh, state legislatures tried to pack minority voters into districts, claiming that the Voting Rights Act required them to do so, um, uh, an argument that the Supreme Court ultimately rejected. And so as we enter into this next round of redistricting, we will see more efforts to try to suppress the political power of minority communities by packing them into districts and also cracking them across districts, which is why practice-based preclearance is so important. Thank you, Professor Tolson. Madam Chair, my final question for Mr. Yang. Mr. Yang, over the past 20 years, the number of Georgians who identify as Asian American has more than doubled. And nationwide, Asian Americans are the fastest growing demographic segment of eligible voters. Why, in your view, is passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act 
critical to protecting voting rights and ballot access for immigrant communities and minority communities like the Asian American community? And why, in your view, is it vital to require pre-approval before states can enact changes like redistricting or closing polling places, please? Thank you for that question. Certainly because Asian Americans are so rapidly growing in the United States in many places that people don't expect, such as Georgia, it's important to have the Modernized Voting Rights Act be passed to protect the, the rights of Asian Americans, really to make sure that they have the that they are able to exercise their voice in democracy. Specifically with respect to the practice-based preclearance, the, the key thing to remember here is that Asian Americans are appearing in places that traditionally have not had minorities, whether it's in Nevada, whether it's in Arkansas, whether it is in other more remote or rural places. And if, if we are only looking at historical, uh, historical geographies, then we may miss the growth of Asian Americans and other communities of color in those geographies. That's why it's also necessary to include practice-based preclearance as a complement to the coverage formula under Section 5. Thank you, Mr. Yang, and thank you, Madam Chair. I yield.